so so this is alan howard he he is uh, my son-in-law and um they're here in town for the weekend my other daughter had a birthday so they they came and and um alan is in the marine corps headed off uh, to a deployment here next next month already this january so next month mm -hmm. and i don't know we were just talking the other day he has these um, i have to look it up i i i facts i facts that's where is it oh i f a k it, it's it's their their military it's well you can say what it is it's all the like emergency stuff um and it was fascinating to us as the family get, getting a little tour of, of his stuff because you know you might need it if there's a car accident or somebody cuts their arm off on a saw in the garage or uh, you know who, who knows a, a gunshot wound um so uh he's going to share all the fun stuff in his his pack that uh i thought was pretty fascinating so alan howard yeah all right so like dan said these are called i facts so it stands for individual first aid kit so in the military, these, these kits are built to be used for the individual carrying them. Um, they're very standardized. Everybody gets the same thing. So that way, if something does happen, I know how to use uh, my buddies and he knows how to use mine. So if there is an instance where I need to use it, everybody knows what's going on. And so we all get the same standard training. Um, I know the Army gets a little bit different, um, different layout. They still get the same basic um, field dressings and stuff, but... Um, for the Marine Corps and the Navy, it is all the same. So they come in easy to use little pouches like this. So everything is contained in this little pouch um, to make it just easier to use. So you have everything you need in a, in a pouch that weighs about a pound, pound and a half. So it's really, really nothing to carry around. Um, typically I have one in my house because that's where most injuries are gonna occur. But I keep one in my truck as well, just in case I'm, I'm driving um, and I see somebody needs help, or if I'm hunting, um, we have it there in my truck, um, just in case. I have a buddy I hunt with a lot. He's very accident prone, and we've had to use a few of these things in my in my IFAC just because he always finds a way to cut himself open or to to break something or something like that. So um, it is designed for like worst case scenario stuff. So like in the military, most times it's gunshot wounds, um, stuff like that, but. Everything here in this pack can be used for multiple purposes. Um, so we can go and uh, look into it. So like I said, it comes in something like this, a little, little pack with a zipper. So the first thing to teach us in boot camp, week one, we get a little bit of introduction to medical stuff. Um, they tell you everybody needs this, this guy right here. So this is called a cat tourniquet. So a C-A-T stands for a combat application tourniquet. So all it is, fancy terms, is just this reinforced band with a plastic clip. So this is designed to stop any major bleeding on um, your appendages, so your arms or legs. So um, back in the old times, um, like World War II, um, and I believe, I can't, World War I, they would use belts. So if somebody had a really deep cut to their leg or their arm, they would take off their belt and they would wrap it around their arm and cinch it down to try to slow the bleeding off because it, cut, it cuts off the circulation from the, the veins and the arteries. Um, that was effective, but you can only get it as tight as a person could pull or the belt would break. These are designed so that the big band like here, so if my arm is bleeding, I can put this on my arm. I can cinch it down. Sorry, I try to get a nice visual of it here for you guys. So I can cinch it down, pull it as hard as I can, tight. But it has this little clip right here, this little bar. And so I can rip this down as hard as I can. And this gives me a little extra oomph, basically, where I can start twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting till the blood, you can actually see the blood physically stop flowing. And so when I get it mm -hmm. tight enough, you can clip it into place in this little C-clip and just secure it. So it's just a more advanced way of what they used to do in the old school military. So I said, everybody, I think everybody should have a tourniquet. Um, Cause like I said, in boot camp, we're trained for gunshot wounds. Um, 
but my dad was a paramedic for a long time and he actually had to throw on a few uh, tourniquets like this. Um, the, the story he told me was I grew up in Kentucky and everybody grew tobacco in Kentucky. And so part of the process to grow it is you have to cut it down when it gets about six feet tall and you dry it in a barn. And one of the guys um, he had to respond to was cutting this tobacco stock down and accidentally cut his leg open. Um, and so my dad, when he responded, showed up to the, uh, to the field, they had to throw a tourniquet on because the guy was bleeding pretty heavily out of his leg. So it doesn't have to be just gunshot wounds. It could be uh, deep lacerations to legs, arms, all that, all that fun jazz. Um, so this is designed for heavy bleeding. Um, it's not something you're going to do if you've got a, a small cut or a small little scratch on you. Um, it is for heavy arterial bleeding. So if you look at it, if you look at the cut or the laceration, whatever it may be, and you can see that it's a very bright, fast moving blood. So it's coming out very quickly. Or if it's kind of coming out in, in spurts, like following your pulse, um, then you know that you've got something pretty serious and that's when you'd want to throw on a tourniquet right away. Um, any questions so far? You can get all this stuff on Amazon too. Yeah. So the good thing about like this whole, everything I'm talking about right now, um, there are YouTube videos galore. I mean, none, none of this is secret. This is stuff that you can buy off Amazon and look up a video on YouTube of how to use it. Um, you've got, I mean, there's a lot of resources on how to use this stuff. It's not, it's not top secret that by, by any means. Um, Alan, I have a question. My, yeah, my name is Poke. Hi. Hi, how when you did the, hi. When did the course start using this? So from what I understand, um, this was a few years ago. This is probably 20 years that they started using tourniquet, maybe, maybe less, 15 years. Okay. Um, I know uh, one of our family friends, in, he was in the Gulf War, and he actually used one of these in the Army, one of the okay. medics in, in the Army. So it's nothing super new. Okay. Um, they've just kind of standardized what they've given out to the military. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so, like, a, my, my grandpa, he was in the Korean War, or not Korean War, Vietnam War, and he, he never had these. He just said if they were always trained to use a belt or something like that, or they could just really try to wrench it down as tight as they could. Um, but that's only so effective. So, some little interesting facts about the tourniquet is if you see this, it's all black, and you can get different colors and stuff like that. It's not black isn't special by any means, but all the tourniquets, no matter what, are going to have that little red tab and that's the tab that you actually will lift up and pull and it's red for a very specific reason red is one of the last colors you see before you pass out so if you are losing blood pretty quickly and you start getting light headed faint anything like that this color is going to be one of the last colors you see so you can still even if your days confused can still see this so you can try to still grab it and uh, cinch it off as quickly as possible okay And then with this clip, you can see, I don't know if you can see in this camera very well. Yeah. So you've got time written on that, uh, that band. So when I'm tightening this down with this little bar and I've got it to how tight that I want it to, I can clip this bar in that little C hook right there. Mm -hmm. And I can put this Velcro strap over it with time. Now, this is more of a, a military thing, uh, just because we can't guarantee how fast people are going to respond to a, uh, an emergency. But we put time here because after three hours of a tourniquet being placed on somebody's appendage, um, the likelihood of a doctor saving that, that leg, that arm is pretty low. The three hours is the standard. So if we can't get somebody medical treatment within three hours, they're probably going to lose whatever this is on, whether it's an arm or a leg. Um, here, like in Des Moines or wherever you may be, you're usually like 20 minutes, 30 minutes away from a hospital. So it's not that big of an issue at that point um, because you can usually call a paramedic or a EMT and they can take you to the hospital quit pretty quickly. Um, but for the military, it's a little bit different because you can't guarantee when that truck can come pick you up or the helicopter can come get you. So like I said, tourniquets are, are very helpful. Um, the, not really just a, a solely military thing. My dad is an EMT. He's, he's carried them. He still has one. I mean, even though he's a, he's a physician right now, never really going to use it anymore, but he keeps one in his truck just in case he does have to, um, 
help help somebody on the side of the road. Um, my wife and I actually we um, we used to watch it. It's, it was a TV show, but it was um, called I Survived. And one of the, the the first episodes you can see is somebody was just mountain biking. Um, he was biking and he went down this hill a little too fast, crashed his bike, and his bike basically fell apart and broke. And a piece of metal went into this guy's um, leg and cut an artery. And so he didn't really have a, a belt or a tourniquet, so he had to actually like physically hold the artery as best as he could to, to stop the blood loss. Um, so, again, that's why I carry one of these everywhere where I'm hunting or just in my. Any questions on the tourniquet at all? All right. So, let's see what we got here. The next thing, again, it's something that's pretty hit on pretty hard in the military, um, is this little guy right here. So these are called chest seals. So I've got one right here to show you guys. So inside that fancy wrapping, you got something that looks like this. It's a little little gel pad. Backing on it. Gel pad, if you look at it, it's pretty, pretty tacky. It's pretty sticky. So this chest seal is designed to go on your chest as the name implies. So whether you have a, um, again, military terms, a gunshot wound, or um, you have a, a, a deep cut to your chest, we would stick a chest seal on it because we want to stop air from coming in to that wound. Um, the way that your chest is designed is it's, it's a pressurized part of your body. Um, so as you breathe and exhale, if you have a deep cut to your chest, the air is going to follow the vacuum. So the outside air will actually go into your chest cavity from that laceration, whether it's a gunshot wound or a knife, which isn't going to cause too big of an issue until the pressure inside of your chest starts to get too great and actually stops your ability to breathe because there's too much pressure inside of your chest and your lungs can't expand. They're not strong enough to expand. So that's when you have a collapsed lung. Um, and it's a pretty, pretty serious thing. So that's why we have these chest seals because you can see right here, these three little holes, those are one way valves. So if for some reason you do have a deep cut and you actually have punctured one of your lungs, air is going to come into your chest cavity, but this one way valve is going to bleed it out for you. So it will escape your wound out of your chest, but it will stop any air from coming in. So you don't have to worry about the pressure change inside of your chest cavity. Um, again, this, this comes from a lot of training is for, for gunshots. Um, because a lot of, a lot of damage happens if you do get a, a good shot to the chest. So uh, more than likely, if you do, um, have a deep cut, you're probably going to get a lung because lungs are, they're, they're big. They take, they take up all of this area right here. Um, luckily you have two. Um, but if one does get poked, um, popped, anything like that, you still have one good lung. You want to protect that lung by putting a, a chest seal on. Any questions on that one? Okay. Sorry if I go too fast. If you guys do have questions, feel free to like shoot your hand up. I don't know everything, but um, I, I'll, I'll answer it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Where do you get replacement parts? If you have to use one at one time, how do you replenish that, the supply? Where do you go? So, um, uh, like, like Dan said, Amazon, you can literally look up a chest seal, type in chest seal on Amazon and you're going to have 50,000 results of, of chest seals that you can, okay. you can purchase. Um, all of this is very easy to find. Um, I know, um, when I lived in, in Tennessee, I had a gun store right down the street from my house and they like a, like a shooting range and they sold all of this stuff. Um, it, it's like I said, none, none of this is a secret by any means. Very, very easy to find. So, Alan, I, I apologize. I was late. Um, I had another meeting. I was late. What branch of the service are you with? Uh, the Marine Corps. Marine Corps. Oh, yes, well, mm -hmm. thank you. So, um, you have this, but in the pack, you get two chest seals. So you have a small round one and you have a larger rectangle one. Now this one doesn't have that one way about the other one does. This one is solely in case there is a gunshot wound, um, sometimes the bullet goes all the way through. 
and usually the exit is bigger than the entrance. So this pad is for the exit wound. Um, it, there's no need for the one-way valve on this one um, because you have it on the, the, the front of the uh, smaller chest seal. Um, most time we don't have to use this back seal. Um, however, if something does happen, you have that as a, as a backup, just in case, just in case you need it, because two is better than one. Any questions on the uh, the chest seal? No. All right. And it, the the chest seal is very sticky, so um, we we um, make jokes, but like everybody's a little bit different. Some some guys have more body hair than others. Um, so if you have like a lot of chest hair, this is designed because you have like, you have about a good two and a half inches of, of gel here. You can get a very tight seal on somebody. The practice is to, if you're putting this chest seal on is to wait on their exhale. So there, there's no air in their lungs. They're exhaling. You would place it then again, just to make sure you have a, a good seal. Um, it's all about getting a, a good airtight seal to stop any air from getting inside of your chest cavity. All right. Next thing we've got is a, is a burn dressing. So this is a, uh, a hydrogel is what they call it, a hydrogel burn dressing. So it comes in this fancy foil packing. All it is, is a jelly dressing. You kind of hear it, if you can hear it, it's very, it's a, a moist gel dressing. It comes in a big strand like that. So this is for um, emergency burns, not for first degree burns. This is kind of, it's wasted on first degree burns. Um, it is for second to third degree burns some very serious burns because of the gel they use. This gel is designed to, to cool um, the burn rapidly, um, give you a little bit of relief um, from that burn. If you are not careful with this, however, and you start to put a few of these on some guy, especially their chest, um, you can actually give somebody hypothermia with this. So if you lay three of these on somebody, you really want to watch their temperature because it can cool it rapidly and cause somebody to go into shock. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's a gel, but it's not sticky. So you want to make sure you, you, you secure it and you, you tie it down. But again, it is designed to rapidly cool the wound. Um, if anybody's ever burned themselves, the burning still happens. So if I burn myself on a fire, even if I rip that off real quick and my arm is out of the fire, it's still continuing to, to burn and to cook my arm basically. So this would be give you like a, a, a instant cooling of that wound itself. So with this, it is designed for um, burns, but not chemical burns. Chemical burns are a little bit different because depending on what you've burned yourself with is gonna have different ways of how to stop that burning, whether it's, um, I know, like some deodorants can cause you to have some burns. You're not going to use this on a burn like that. Um, some like battery acid, you're not going to want to use this because this is a gel that traps. So it, it, so if you put this on a chemical burn, it's going to trap whatever chemical is on your skin and you really don't want to trap anything on your skin. Um, nothing really special about that. You really would just pull it out of the wrapping and you just place it on that burn um, as best you can. Because it has a, it has a, um, oh, this white backing to it. It's almost like a gauze material. You can cut this. So if you have um, a short wound, but it's wide, you can cut this into multiple strips and layer it down. Or if you just have one long burn, for some reason, you can just lay that whole strip down on it and you'd be, you'd be good to go. Uh. Um, so this used to be, um, again, Mostly the Gulf Wars, we found out a lot of, from what I've been told, we found a lot of these mistakes that we made. The clothing that the uh, military used to go into battle with was just normal cotton, polyester kind of blend stuff. Stuff that if it get, catches on fire, it melts, melts your skin pretty bad. So the, um, the military actually changed the clothing that they would wear. So for the Marine Corps, we use what we call frogs or flame resistant organizational gear. So um, for the most part, we're not going to have anything melt into our skin. However, you're, on your day-to-day -day life, you're probably not going to wear flame retardant clothing. So that's why it's nice to have some sort of um, burn um, dressing to, uh, to help with any um, burns you may get. 
Um, I almost use this. I haven't used this yet, but I did almost use this on my nephew because he uh, found plastic and learned that if you put a flame on plastic, it likes to shrivel up. And so he was playing with plastic and before he could catch him doing it, he, he shriveled it up and like burnt his finger pretty bad. It was only first degree burn. So luckily we didn't have to use it. But um, again, if you've got kids, they like to find stuff to do. And sometimes it's not always the best. I was one of those kids where I was just a terrible kid. So stuff like this is it's just, it's just nice to have around. <laughs> so, Dan, Dan, yeah, I was just wondering if Dan knew that uh, before he said you could marry his daughter. Yeah, oh, yeah, we heard, we heard the stories. <laughs> oh, you had? Okay, I, yeah. I just wanted to know. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm always told my parents that uh, <laughs> that uh, the world works in funny ways, and my kids are probably going to be as bad or worse than me, so I got that to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with that burn dressing, that, that, that gel pad, we also have a dry sterile burn dressing so nothing fancy it just comes in everything comes sealed so it's sterile um so you don't have to worry about infection anything like that so you got this nice little green square even though this says it's a burn dressing this is a multifunctional item so it is non-adhesive um, and it is a dry dressing even on the label if you look right here on the label it says can be used for multiple multiple things so when you take, take it out of this plastic wrapping, you get this big old handkerchief, basically, a sterile handkerchief. This thing is a massive triangle. So as I said, this, this burn gel isn't really isn't an adhesive, so you have to hold it down. You can use this as, um, as a pressure bandage, basically. So if you have a burn, you can place the gel on their, their body and tie this around them because it is large enough to tie around your torso just tie this down on them so that you don't have to continually hold it. You can free up your hands and um, drive or do whatever you need to do. This also comes in very uh, handy and we have used it before in this way as a, as a sling. Um, if somebody does break their arm, which we had somebody in my unit break their arm as they fell down a hill or rolled down a hill, because it's a triangle like this, you can tie it into a sling. So you can patch them up, sling them up so they don't have to worry about their arm, arm hanging. You can use it as a, as, a, as a pressure bandage. So if you do have a cut, but you don't want to continuously hold a, a gauze to it, you can really tight it down um, and hold it there. So you can, again, free up your hands. 90% of the stuff you can use for, for multiple applications. And that's what's so great about it is even though um, it says burn dressing, this right here is designed to be used for, for multiple things because the military is cheap and don't want to, they don't want to buy multiple things when they can have one thing fill multiple jobs. <laughs> so. So that's with with the burns. Um, like I said, with this 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 burn burn gel, it is for second and third degree burns. You don't really want to use it for first degree burns because it, it's kind of a waste at that point when you can find like a small little ointment to to ease the pain of a first degree burn. This is for some serious stuff. All right. Next thing we have here is what we call an H bandage. Sometimes you'll hear, hear people say Israeli bandage because it was the Israelis that designed this, this dressing. All it is, is as the name implies, it has this H, this H clip is a hard, hard plastic, but it's just a wrap. So you enroll it and it's just long, long, long sports wrap basically with a gauze sewn into it so i have used this on myself before um because i was again in tennessee i was walking around and i stepped in a big washout pile of leaves and sticks and i stepped right onto an arrow with a broadhead on it and sliced my leg open that was a good mile and a half away from my truck and i didn't want to have to continually hold a, a bandage to it so what you can do is you can place this this pad this gauze on whatever wound it is wrap it around and use this H to really like tighten it down by spinning it and twisting it. And it will lock into place using Velcro. So you got the Velcro right here. So it is, it is designed for um, a, 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 a decent wound. You can see this is all one big gauze. Um, so you can use it for a, a decent wound. Um, but again, it lets you free up your hands. You can 
tie it, you can really twist it down and give you a lot of pressure. So it helps stop the bleeding. Um, but you don't have to worry about losing one of your hands or the functionality of your hands in, in the process. So, like I said, when I was, in, when I cut myself, um, I had a pretty decent size gash, it was about 10 inches. Um, and so I had to, to walk a pretty long way. So I was able to use this and free up my hands because in Tennessee, we got mountains, we got hills where you get to sometimes the easiest way is to go over the, over the hill and you have to use uh, your hands and your feet with that. So you can also use this. So with that, with the tourniquet, um, you can put the tourniquet on and have this help you to cover the wound to make sure nothing, no debris gets in there. Um, just use it as a, as a bandage as itself. Any questions with this one? And so the good thing is, you know, the joke is Marines are not the smartest bunch of the military. Everything has pictures and instructions. So um, if you do find yourself in need of using something like this, um, everything is, we call Marine proof. It's foolproof. They've got pictures to show you exactly how to do it. It's lovely, lovely stuff. <laughs> they take the thought out of it for you. <laughs> um, everybody's seen this before. This right here is just your standard gauze. Nothing, nothing special about it at all. Um, it looks really small just because they, they got this thing vacuum packed pretty tight. It's just, uh, makes it uh, easier to stow away. Um, you don't have to worry about it unfolding on you. If you do take it out of this packaging right here, pretty thin, it will expand to about that. So like I said, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty vacuum uh, packed pretty tight in there. So just a standard gauze. Um, you can use it for um, like a mild, mild bleed, you can use it as a bandage. We've used this as a, as a um, way to make a splint. So if somebody's break, break their arm, we can wrap it around their arm with sticks or whatever we need to support it. Um, to use it as a splint. Again, it's multi-purpose, um, so it's it's pretty easy, pretty easy to use. Like I said, everybody everybody has seen gauze. Nothing nothing special about about this stuff. Yeah. This stuff is a little bit different. So this is a combat gauze. Um, this is infused, and I meant to look up the chemical because I can never remember it. But it's a long, like twelve syllable word that starts with a Z. Very difficult to remember sometimes. What this chemical does is it activates um, the 12th clotting factor of your blood. Long story short, it just skips a bunch of steps and makes your blood clot very fast and very efficient. We use this for major bleeds where we cannot put a tourniquet on. So where we said we can put the tourniquet on your arm or your leg, we can't put a tourniquet on your shoulder. We can't put a tourniquet in your, your hips or in your groin area. Like you can't put a tourniquet on your neck. So this is designed um, to help stop the bleeding in areas where you cannot place a tourniquet. So with this, you would, if you have a, a, a deep laceration to your shoulder or to your neck, you can take this out and it comes, we call it Z-packed, where it's basically just packed in like an accordion. So you can pull it out, you get the wound, and it's kind of difficult to imagine, but if you've got a wound in your neck, you have to grab this and pack it into your wound. So you got to start just putting it in there and packing and packing and packing. And we say it's difficult because everyone can say, oh yeah, I could do that. Until it actually happens, you have to put your finger in your neck or put your finger in your shoulder or your hip. Um, it can get kind of scary. But this does its job by filling whatever void was caused by the, that wound, giving no space for blood to come out and clotting that blood very fast and very efficiently. So it's one of those things where if you do have to use it, you want to you wanna use it because it, it could be the difference between you going home and not making it home. So um, this stuff is, is, is saved a lot of, a lot of people's lives. Um, this is, you can see this on an x-ray. So if you do pack this into your wound, um, a doctor can very easily see um, this on an x-ray. In fact, most of the time, if you do have some sort of internal bleeding, the first thing a doctor is going to do is to assess you. And if you can make it to a, a, an x-ray or an MRI, they're going to do that first before they even start to work on you just so they can see the amount of damage that there is. And this is going to glow in that. So they'll know like, oh, there's something in there that is helping to stop the, the, that flow of blood. Um, with a little bit of history on this, again, the Gulf War, um, Vietnam, learned a lot of stuff about medicine, um, the military. This used to come in... Um, it was almost like sugar or like a salt, like a granulated package. 
So if somebody did have some, some deep bleeding, you would open this package up and you'd pour that, that, that salt, that sugar into the wound and it would basically burn it and seal it. Um, we stopped using that because um, it never got deep enough for the wounds. So you had a pretty deep cut to your leg. You could only get as deep as those, those granulated material would get in there. So it didn't usually go that deep to, to, to fix that bleeding. There's also the, uh, the issue of wind. So if you went to go pour that, the wind would take it and carry it away and you'd lose half your, your, uh, your stuff before you even got to the wound. And if the wind was bad or a helicopter landed and that stuff got in your eye, it would burn your eye and you'd essentially go blind because it's designed to seal moisture away. So that's why we use something like this now because it's much easier to control where it goes. We don't have to worry about the wind blowing away or blowing in your face and your eye. And it's also easily contained. So we don't have to worry about, um, again, like opening this up and spilling it and losing everything that we have. We can just open it up. It comes in a big gauze like this and we have a lot more control over where it goes and how we, how we place it. Again, this is for heavy bleeding where you cannot place a tourniquet. They do, um, is anybody allergic to shellfish? Anybody, anybody allergic to shellfish? No. No. No? Okay. So this brand is called Quick Clot. If you can see it without the reflection, Quick Clot. That's what the military uses for the simple reason that there is another brand. And you want to, if you, if you do purchase this, um, or you buy it on Amazon, wherever you get it from, um, there is a brand out there that uses um, a similar formula, except instead of using this synthetic chemical that Quick Clot uses, or the military uses, it uses shellfish, something from the actual shellfish, um, the shell itself. They're not sure how it works, but they know that this, this chemical from the shellfish itself does the same thing. It, it activates the clotting factors in your blood and just puts it into hyperdrive. But the issue with that is, is if you are allergic to shellfish, you can go into anaphylaxic shock because it, again, it is shellfish that you're pouring into your, your wound. They, they make synthetic stuff now. So it's, it's the same chemical, but it's synthetic to avoid that issue. Um, but again, we use this for the simple fact that it doesn't have that shellfish. It has a very common synthetic compound that uh, starts that blood clotting process in your body. Again, just one of those things where the military was testing out and realized that they would pour some, some powder to stop a wound and people were starting to get, have swollen throats or their faces would swell up and they're like, oh, they're having an anaphylactic reaction and find out that there's shellfish in some of these compounds. Quick clot doesn't have that. So that's why the military uses it now. Any questions with that one? All right. Like I said, that stuff has saved a lot of lives because um, if you do have a, a deep wound to your shoulder, your hip, you can't place a tourniquet. If you don't have that, you, you got to just use what you can. And most of the time, it's not going to stop the, the bleeding. It's not going to clot that bleeding. Whereas this would actually cause your blood to, to clot very rapidly, very efficiently. So one of the last things that we have that we are given and issued is just a simple little little eye patch here. So this is an aluminum eye patch um, cup to fit around your eye. And this is used um, in case somebody does get a lot of, a lot of junk in their eye, a lot of, a lot of sand or um, fiberglass. For some reason we have, we have fiberglass. Um, you can put this on, um, on your eye. You can duct tape it down because duct tape is heavenly, made by the angels themselves. Um, you can tape it down to your face to prevent anybody from trying to get into their eye because our, our reaction right off the bat if we have something in our eyes to try to rub it and you don't want to. You can scratch your eye up if it's something like you have large pieces of metal or fiberglass or wood, you start to rub your eye, you're going to really damage your eye. So you can stop people from trying to rub their eye, stop yourself from trying to rub your eye by placing this over top of it and duct taping it down. So it's just got this little like fabric around it because if you take this fabric off, you can see these little different plates. And because it's aluminum, very malleable. So you can actually bend this to your, your face. So that way you don't have a gap in between right here. You don't have a gap where you can actually stick your finger up in there and again, try, try to rub it. 
Another use for this is if you have a large piece of debris and um, the first thing that comes to mind is like a, a large piece of metal actually sticking in your eye or out of your, or, or wood in your eye where it's not a bunch of small pieces, it's just one large piece. The way it's designed for all these holes is you can actually punch this out very easily with a knife or a pair of scissors, something like that. You can punch it out to fit whatever shape is sticking out of your eye and tape it and tape the, the item itself. Try not to move it as much as possible, but you can tape it down so that um, you can secure it from not getting moved around and doing more damage that it already has, has done. Um, my, um, we, we never used this. Um, my, my dad did have to use some, I don't remember what he used, but my brother, one time he was real little, um, real, real small, and he was running full speed um, lost control, run down this hill, ran to a barbed wire fence and sliced his eye all the way up. Um, and so, of course, as a kid, you see blood, you like, you feel this pain, you're going to grab right, at, right away. And my dad didn't know what the extent of the damage was. And as an EMT, he just grabbed my brother's hand, pulled it down and used, used something similar to this. I don't think it was this, but used something similar to this and just taped it to my brother's face so that he wouldn't try to like dig at his eye because he just didn't know the extent of the damage. Um, it was only a few stitches. So it was just a kid like bleeding and scared, but um, this can help prevent somebody causing more damage themselves by trying to rub their eye or trying to pull a piece of metal out of their eye or anything similar to that. So um, all of this stuff that we have or were issued is to do just immediate medical attention, do what we can to help what we can, um, but it's not designed to, to fix anything by any means. Um, this is just to stabilize yourself to, to get to the hospital. Um, like I said earlier, here in Des Moines, we're, we're here, um, I think, from, from Dan's house, I'm like 25 minutes away from Mercy. Very quickly, could I go to the hospital and not have to worry about too many issues. Um, but the military, we have what we call the golden hour. So all these are designed to keep you um, stable within an hour. Um, we call it the golden hour because if you can get medical attention within that hour, your chances of survival are much higher. Um, think like 87% depending on the wound. Um, so you're more likely to survive. Anything outside of that hour and your survival rate drastically drops, drastically drops. Again, depending on the wound. If you have a burn, not so much, but if you have a deep laceration to your chest or a, uh, a, a bleeder in your arm, that's going to be something more serious. So well, that's why we call it the golden hour. Everything is here is designed to keep you alive for that hour. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we are issued. Um, basically for the Marine Corps, the Navy has the same stuff. So all of our, our corpsmen, our, our, our doctors get the same stuff when they're with us. This is just the, the basic items that we are given. Um, we also have like a boo-boo kit. We get band-aids, we get aspirin, we get stuff like that. Cause you really don't want to crack out your quick clot for a small scratch to your forehead or small scratch to your arm, because you want this when you actually need it. You don't want to use it for something small. And then when you do have a larger wound, you don't have it. Alan, uh, what is the, what is the kit called? This is called an IFAC, an individual IFAC. first aid kit. So you can go on Amazon um, and you can get the um, IFAC itself. That's already, pre-built. Um, some of them are kind of iffy uh, because it's going to tell you it's an IFAC, but it's just got a bunch of band-aids and gauze in it. It's not going to have a lot of stuff that you need. So most of the time it's more beneficial to um, buy the pieces individually, um, but it really just depends on the, on the kit you're looking at. I thought I, you said it was called a boo-boo kit. So no, we, we have a boo-boo <laughs> kit. <laughs> we have a boo-boo kit. I love kit. it. A boo -boo kit. You the Everyone one needs a boo-boo kit in their purse. <laughs> Yeah. So I actually show you, this is what, this is my actual military IFAC. This is what I have to carry on my body armor with me at all times. So we have the zipper pouch right here for all of the IFAC material. That's all the stuff I've talked about in there. So we have that. And this little pouch right here holds all my band-aids and my ointments and my, my salves, my aspirin, my Motrin, all that stuff. Um, Again, it, it, it's important to kind of look. So what, I, what I've done for the one I carry around in my truck and stuff, it's important to look at what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and what works case scenario you're going you're gonna to see. So I hunt a lot. I've got a buddy who's accident prone. He's sliced his hand open multiple times. 
Um, so I do have um, a tourniquet because um, I also hunt with guns. So just be careful. Um, I have gauzes. I have quick clots in my hunting bag just in case for some odd reason, my buddy Matt decides to slice his arm off or decides to shoot a bow into him or shoot an arrow into himself because he's just done multiple things. So I've just learned to just look at what I, what I do on a day-to-day basis, what I might encounter and just build my, my first aid kit to that. I also have, um, when they lived here, I had a nephew and two nieces that lived with me who are adventurous to say it nicely. They like to find things and get into things. So I had a, a stuff for, um, for them just in case it was an emergency for them. I could help them and get them to the hospital before anything serious happened. Um, most time it was just band-aids here and there, but like I said, my nephew almost melted plastic onto his arm. So I was, thought I was going to have to use uh, a burn dressing or something like that. Didn't have to, but just, it was nice to be able to, to have that if he did need it. Um, cause kids get scared. Kids will cry. And if you can do whatever you can do to help make them feel a little bit better, um, is beneficial for them. We, we got one for our truck. Uh, you know, in case there's a, an accident mm-hmm. with us or we come upon one might help somebody before the EMTs get there. Yeah. And so, like I said, the one in my truck, I, I keep multiple. So instead of just having one, I have three in my truck, three of everything, just in case there is an accident, um, you can help somebody out. Like I said, I lived in, Tennessee for a while and in Tennessee they've got a lot of roads in the mountains where it's a pretty pretty solid drop if you go off the side of the mountain um you're dropping 10 to 15 feet and it's going to cause a lot of damage to somebody so I always carried a bunch of extras just in case I did roll up on somebody and they needed help and we can patch them up as best I could for the uh, the EMTs rolled up take to the hospital any questions at all about any of this stuff So before you're deployed, Mm -hmm. is that one of the checklist items to make sure that is uh, fully packed? This is a before deployment, during deployment, every day kind of thing to make sure that we've got it. Okay. Well, I'm lucky enough where this is, this is my first deployment. It's not a combat deployment, um, which my wife really enjoys. Um, But the, um, for the Marine Corps, we get assigned a doc. He's a, he's a Navy personnel. He is our, essentially our EMT that is with us at all times. So my doc has deployed four times and they've all been combat deployments. So he's actually, he's seen a lot of, and had to use every, every bit of this stuff. Um, And so he has given us a lot of, a lot of training that he has seen. He's given us the military version of the training. He's given us what he has done in certain situations. So everything that I've kind of given you guys is stuff that he's, he's told us, um, that he's, he's actually had to, to use because he's had to patch up a few guys um, before. Um, but yes, this is a post-deployment, pre-deployment, during deployment, all of this stuff is, is, is checked to make sure that we have it just in case we need it. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like I said, this, this stuff, it's, it's not a secret. Everything that I've said is just kind of like, a, I mean, you can find this on YouTube very easily. Um, the items themselves, they're marine proof. They have pictures. They have step-by-step instructions of what to do um, just in case you do have to use it um, and you just have that your adrenaline pumping, you don't know what to do. You, f- you f- do like a brain dump, forget it. You can easily look step-by-step, oh, how to put the H bandage on, how to um, put the chest seal on, how to, and when to use the combat guys. It's, it's, a, it's a foolproof, foolproof system. Make it very easy for people to use. All right. Does, any, any other questions? Do you think the uh, the Air Force and the uh, and the Army may have borrowed this from the uh, the pictures primarily from the uh, <laughs> from the Corps, or did the Corps borrow them from the other branches of service? I'm not sure. What, it's kind of like the thing where like what came first, the chicken or the egg? I'm not sure. That's it. Yeah, I'm not sure who who um, who first started to use this stuff. Um, probably the Air Force because they're a little bit smarter than us, but they don't see that much combat. <laughs> um, I'm not no, sure. I, I, I appeal to that because I was in the air guard. So, I, oh, yeah. that, that was my tr- chosen branch. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure who, who first uh, first started doing this stuff. Um, I know, like I'm talking to my papa, he was in Vietnam, and he was always 
taught like if somebody's bleeding they just use a belt and so somebody smart enough came along like well how about instead of a belt we just make something like this where it get a little bit tighter and probably made a million dollars on that idea um so i'm just not sure who, who first started doing it but i know it's a it's a standard practice against or standard practice with all of the forces yeah. so yeah. national guard the army air force air guard marines navy they all have this same basic setup where ever everybody's getting this same tourniquet because the, the army or the military buys these by the, the millions. Um, they might have a little bit different chest seal or a different H uh, bandage, but it's the same thing, essentially. It's just maybe a different brand. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, uh, certainly appreciate you um, talking to us today on short notice. I appreciate Dan making the suggestion and, I finally got back from vacation and started reading emails and thought, oh, I panicked last night and I saw, I'm glad it worked out for today mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that you were able to um, give us this good information. Yeah. Um, I, I see blood and I, I kind of am, a, I'm a problem. I have to go the other way. So mm -hmm. I'm not very good at fixing things. Yeah. And so, and Ian, I, I, I just want to keep, keep saying it because I mean, uh, I've only been talking, I'm talking for an hour and it honestly is not enough. An hour talk, me talking to you is not enough to really get proficient with using this stuff. But YouTube, YouTube is a great tool because you have easy videos that break down how to use the specific items and how to um, really, again, make it foolproof for people. So me talking for an hour is just not going to, not going to be enough to be able to grab an H bandage and use it, use it effectively, especially in a stressful situation. So mm -hmm. if you, if you do decide to um, start to, to build up a, an emergency trauma kit like this, or an IFAC, um, and if you're just not hundred percent sure on anything, YouTube is going to be a great resource. Um, I know there's a guy that even I I'll watch sometimes because things I want to refresh myself. Um, he's EMT in Iowa that um, he'll go through every, every bit of the stuff and just break it down so that you can uh, learn how to use it effectively. Cool. Okay, thanks, Alan. Mm -hmm. Alan, I, Josh, are, you an, uh, are you a medic? I am not. I am a uh, military police officer in the Marine Corps. Oh, okay. So, I, like I, I said, maybe you're a medic. <laughs> no, so the, the guy who trained me, he is a um, uh, Navy corpsman. So that's our, our EMTs. For the Marine yeah. Corps, he's the one who trained me on all of this stuff. Uh, we we learn in boot camp and stuff. We learn the basics in boot camp. We we call them ditties, like basically like little little rhymes to remember the stuff, how to use stuff. But he's the one who broke everything down. This is why we use this. This is how the quick clock works, so that we have a better understanding of it, so that we can um, not only use it ourselves, but help train other individuals who may want to learn how to use this stuff. Okay. Well, good luck on your deployment. Oh, I I'm appreciate sure it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your wife will not be too excited about that. She is uh, not too excited about it. <laughs> Do you know where you're going or can tell us where you're going or not really? Um, I know, but it's not something I can really tell. Okay, that's uh, fine. I didn't know if you could tell. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thank um, you. Thanks, Alan. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alan. Thank you very much. Y'all have a wonderful day. You too. Yeah.